Okay, I'll go ahead and start. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Alicia Olguin. I'm a conservation director serving the Southeast Nebraska region. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Some brief information before we start the webinar for anybody who's new. Conservation Nebraska started uh, the Common Ground Program in 2016. This program educates Nebraskans across the state about conservation issues facing the communities, communities we're serving in by hosting educational webinars like this one. Um, and then during the presentation, if you have any questions, please type those out in the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen or in the chat option. And make sure you direct that to all the panelists and attendees. And then once the webinar is done you um, and you leave, a tab will open on your web browsers with a survey survey that um, we would love for you to complete. Um, this help us me helps us measure our outreach and is used uh, for grant reporting. And today we're going to be discussing wildlife management and hunting practices in Nebraska. We have three speakers with us. Um, we have Dr. Dr. Larkin Powell, uh, Jackson Ellis, and Holly Green. And we're going to start off with Dr. Powell. Um, he is the professor in of con sorry for, in, of conservation biology, animal and animal ecology, in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I'll let him go ahead and. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen and I guess I'll just start by saying that um, I'm uh, going to try to focus tonight on um, some of the things that we uh, teach our students. So Jackson may enjoy this again, right? Uh, this is uh, some things that we have, uh, have done in uh, kind of showing the context for the making these management decisions. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> there's, there, I'm going to again talk about how we how we decide how we manage the harvest of wildlife in Nebraska. And we might answer some simple questions here tonight if I'm successful in the in the few minutes I'll spend with you uh, just thinking about why we have harvest regulations and how we actually determine you know, what those bag limits and things like that should be. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, travel back in time a little bit to think about the history of our harvests and hunting um, in Nebraska. And then we'll talk more about the modern process that supports the decisions for regulations that we make. And, and then last, we'll, since we're here as an interested group of people, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how we can all provide input in that uh, process. So wildlife is a public trust in the United States and, and that uh, history of public trust applies to other resources but, but besides wildlife. But wildlife are a great example and obviously our, our, that's our target tonight. And essentially what that means is that you can't own wildlife expect, except in some very you know, specific situations where you have permits uh, to have like a deer farm or something that um, in, in the United States, we all as a, as a public um, own collectively our wildlife resources and the, our government that we've formed holds that wildlife resource as a trust. And so that's where we get this public trust idea. And in the United States, the idea for this public trust is that it's uh, because we're a federation of, of states, individual states in our United States, that that uh, is mostly happens, that those decisions mostly happen for how we should use that resource at the state level. Um, and so like, I can't make decisions by myself um, uh, the city of Lincoln can't really make too many decisions by themselves, but the state of Nebraska can. And we have the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission that is um, that serves as the agency of the government that makes those decisions. In a few cases, we have uh, decided that the federal government needs to coordinate some things. So with migratory birds and endangered species are two examples where those decisions are made at the federal level. Uh, for coordination purposes. But in other countries, as shown on the right side of this slide, um, that the level of decision making slides up and down. And there are some countries like Thailand where the decisions are totally made 
at the national level. And in fact, in Thailand, they don't have hunting. Um, and that's a social reason because of the Buddhist religion that dominates there and how they feel that you should treat animals. Um, but in Namibia, they've actually given the allocation of decisions down to the landowner. Um, and in Sweden and Norway, those allocations are down to more like the county or township level uh, where there's boards that make those decisions. But, but in both those cases, in Norway, Sweden, and Namibia, uh, there's a lot of onus on the individual person to do game counts on their land and to, to provide the data that we provide at the state level for Nebraska. So that's a concept for us as we move forward is to think about how we make decisions as people um, through our government. And that's how we set our harvest regulations. I just wanted to, we're, we're talking about hunting tonight and um, harvest management. The, you know, here's, a, we'll get to hunting in just a second, but the participation levels for fishing in the United States, this isn't something that a majority of our uh, citizens do, even though we have um, uh, the wildlife and fish are in the public trust, the harvest of those is, is an activity that only a few individuals in the country do. And so it's around 20% um, that fish in the United States. And then here's hunting and you can see that that's about half what the fishing was. And in this uh, West Central region, or sorry, West North Central region that we're a part of, um, it's actually one of the highest areas in the country for participation. Uh, this was data from about four years ago, I think, that 8% um, of the population in, uh, across those states here um, in the upper Great Plains and Midwest um, hunt. So that's also something for us just to keep in mind is that you know, nationwide, only 4% of people in the United States participate in this sport. And I have a feeling we may hear from some other speakers tonight about that just a little bit more. In terms of the wildlife, it's also a minority of the species that are out there, the diversity that are out there on the plains that are hunted species. Um, and so about 12% of our birds and mammals fall into what we call game animals that, that have a regulated harvest season um, and harvest regulations. And of course they're used for food and, and fur and, and their hides. And so there's, there's reasons why people are going out to harvest those animals. Um, they, um, and they, they, those species that are game animals tend to have certain characteristics um, that they're species with high reproductive rates. So there is a, um, they're, they're reproducing a lot every year. And um, they also tend to have polygamous mating systems in that multiple uh, uh, females can be bred by the same male. And so if you take one male out of the population, it's not as tough on the population as it is if they're more monogamous mating systems. Okay, so just a little bit of background there. If we go way back in history, of course, uh, well, not way, way back, but this is you know 250 years ago or so, um, we can, um, or 150 years ago, we can, we can think about some failures that we had with harvest management. And that's flavored a lot of what we do in the United States and how we approach harvest management. Um, the bison, the near extirpation of bison, the extinction of passenger pigeons, um, those things were events that happened as we were, as uh, mostly white America was moving um, into, the, into the West and uh, there was not a lot of enforcement and there were not a lot of regulations and rules in, this, in these new territories that, that had very little government um, in them actually. And so the, we weren't equipped to think about harvest in a sustainable way and some bad things happened then. Um, here's a picture from Nebraska, the Stir Museum photo here of some prairie chickens. Um, and this is the time of market hunting in the 1880s, 1890s, where a lot of animals were shipped east uh, on railroad cars to be eaten in the restaurants in, in New York City and Chicago and purchased by citizens there. So um, again, this was a, a time of very little regulations and we didn't have things like hunting seasons and bag limits at this point, obviously, because apparently this is one one guy and three dogs and a gun can do all this. There's a couple, looks like there's a couple jackrabbits hanging there too. 
Um, but by the 1930s and the 1940s, we had changed the way we did things as the century turned into the 1900s. And this is, I'm just going to symbolize this here with the duck stamp. That is something that today uh, duck hunters have to, um, waterfowl hunters have to purchase to be legal as they, as they hunt waterfowl. Uh, but non, um, non hunters can also purchase these from post offices or from like Game and Parks Commission offices and other locations. And you can get them online as well. Um, and uh, they're a little more than a dollar now that they were in, in 1934, 1935 when the first ones came out. But using the money that's been uh, derived from this, mostly um, purchased by hunters and, and funds that come from hunters, there's been 6 million acres that have been uh, reestablished for wetlands and other uh, habitat um, since 1934, 6 million acres. And that's more than 300 national wildlife refuges have either expanded or just been created in the first place. Uh, more than 300 of those national wildlife refuges. So that's like DeSoto and Crescent Lake here um, and Valentine Refuge in Nebraska, um, uh, most likely benefited from duck stamp monies um, if we trace that back. So there's, there's quite a bit of uh, support there and uh, some positive feedbacks that we see now in the, in the way that we're managing our harvest. And so we come to today where we have regulations. And every year, the Game and Parks Commission puts out these guidebooks that have regulations. We may talk more about specific regulations uh, this evening. But um, generally, there's two goals of having those regulations. And one is to keep a population of wildlife um, at a sustainable level. Sometimes we're trying to decrease it. Snow geese might be an example of that right now. Other times, we're trying to make sure that we don't go below a certain level. Sandhill cranes might be one that we watch uh, fairly closely to make sure that, that, that we're not over harvesting that population. Um, and we also have as a second goal, and this is what the wildlife managers you know, have to pull their hair out about is, they're trying to make sure that we keep the population there, but that we also allow a hunting opportunity for the public that does own this wildlife in the public trust and has a um, potential uh, right in some cases to, to feel like the, the, that they uh, have access to that wildlife um, as part of that. So we have those two goals. So how do we get to those regulations? Well, there's really three types of regulations. If you're not too familiar with harvest regulations, if you haven't participated in hunting as much, or even if you have, you might not have thought about the, the kind of different levels of regulation. One is just a simple question of whether we're going to allow harvest or not for a species. And so, you know, like, for example, mountain lions in Nebraska has been one recently that there's been controversy about. And so um, that's a species that, you know, should it be a game animal, should it not be a game animal? Once it becomes a game species, then we can talk about the way that we would hunt that species. And so prairie chickens in eastern Nebraska is another example that, you know, within the last 20 years, um, became huntable in that part of the state. So how we hunt those species is also something that's regulated. The methods of take, the, the you know, is it firearm? It, are we going to allow bows and arrows? Uh, for fish, you know, people ask like, can we allow spear fishing or not? Uh, there's safety rules, like with certain species, you have to wear hunter orange. So all the deer hunters out there, they're not just wearing orange because they are afraid of being shot. They're actually required to, to wear it as part of the regulations for how we hunt those species. And there may be other things like the, the timing of uh, when you can start, like a uh, half hour before sunrise as a start time for, for deer hunting. Um, and some of those are, that type of regulations are biologically, um, like we might restrict the type of uh, method of take if we want to tighten down and not allow so much harvest. Um, and so we may not allow as much uh, har harvest to be taken with rifle, for example. Um, but other times we're using uh, social things and ethics. And so there's a lot of examples of where um, people in different states have different traditions. And so he, some people in some states, uh, for example, dogs may be allowed to be used in the process of hunting a certain species of, of game animal. 
Um, and in one state, that may be, be considered completely unethical. And why would you use dogs? And in another state, um, like for example, in the Southern United States, the use of dogs is a lot more common than it is in Northern states. So, so there's some things that are more social that go into those regulations as well. And then the last one is the one that I'll talk just a little bit more about is what level of take should be allowed. And that's meaning how much of this population, the proportion of the population that would be harvested each year. And so we typically govern that with, there's several little uh, dials and levers that a biologist and a manager can pull there. Uh, but the two most common that we would think about would be like the length of the season, the longer the season, the more would be allowed to take. If we restrict that season down, like the firearm deer season is what, nine days long. Um, so, so we're gonna restrict that to that. If we made that longer, there'd be more deer taken is the, is the thought. So, um, and then bag limits, how many can you take uh, per day, for example, and possession limits, how many can you keep in your freezer? And those are often changed every year while these other types of uh, regulations, the first two may be fairly constant, okay? Um, so, but, but biologists have to think about the, the last two as populations change. And just as an example of some of the ways that we can manage these and have different regulations as we look at the populations in different areas, um, and I'll use duck hunting as an example here, uh, we use a flyway approach in the United States because as a migratory bird, this is something that the federal government oversees. And so we've got these flyways as the birds are flying south during the fall, during hunting season, um, different flyways join together, the state uh, agencies join together with the federal government to make decisions about when um, they're going to allow harvest and how much harvest um, per the federal guidelines in each flyway. But then you can also, and so like the, the bag limits may be different in the Pacific Flyway than they are in the Central Flyway, or at least the maximums that the states could employ. And a state might choose to be lower than the maximum that the federal government allows, uh, but they can't be higher. So we can come then into Nebraska and you can see back in 2012, an image that I grabbed uh, quickly off the internet today, showed the zones that were in play for duck hunting in Nebraska then. And you can see that there, there are some reasons why the waterfowl biologists in Nebraska felt that there were some needs for specific regulations in specific zones in Nebraska. And those may have been when harvest uh, started. It may have had to do with uh, bag limits that were allowed in various zones, um, but, but there are specific regulations that were deployed in different zones. And so that's pretty fine tuned management there to be able to spatially go in and think about uh, populations and when migration occurs in different parts of the state um, and how, how folks can manage. So, so the, I guess one of the points there is that managers are doing, a, uh, they're, they're following a pretty specific set of guidelines here to set up regulations that protect the species and still allow us hunting opportunity. And then as you ask the question, so how do they make the call each year? Like what the bag limits are gonna be? Well, there's a lot of information that goes into that. So that's something else that we're teaching our students at the University of Nebraska is how to go out and do the research and the monitoring in addition to the management end of things. And so they need to know how many ducks are gonna be flying south over the United States to set those bag limits. And there's different inputs that they get there. They do May surveys up in the breeding grounds uh, from airplanes. They do pond counts as well, because the better, the more ponds there are, the more water there is in the landscape, those ducks are gonna breed more and there's gonna be more juveniles. So no matter how many breeding animals there are, we have to account for how many birds are produced that year because those are huntable animals as well. Um, and so we do brood index surveys and then every year, in addition to those other surveys, we're looking at the hunter bag information that comes in. And there's a lot of information about that will tell us what portion of the population was harvested and what the age structure was that year. That can give us a, a hint at what productivity was that year as well, how many babies were produced. And so they'll take all that information, put it in a population model. And so we need some quantitative folks that can help us here as well. And we can predict if we had this uh, set of regulations, 
we would predict that this would happen to the population. If we had that set of regulations, we'd predict that that would happen to the population. And so the last thing I just wanted to share with you is that now we've gotten to the point, you can kind of see the information that goes into this, but there's a process that if Game of Parks decides that they want to allow mountain hunt, lion hunting, or if they want to um, change the uh, duck zones in the state, or if they want to change the bag limit for pheasants, they're going to have a series of public meetings and they're gonna go through a harvest management process. And there's a lot of points where as stakeholders and part of society, we can have individual input and also where we can see that there's political input through people that we've elected to represent us in the legislature. Sometimes these complicate things. A game of parks biologist might get a little frustrated because the, you know, they've got somebody at the legislature leaning on them and the governor appoints the commissioners that are a part that are actually form the commission that the biologists are making these recommendations to. Um, and then they've got Joe or Jane Schmo out here in the public that are complaining because the, this new duck zone is gonna be bad for them. And so, but that's the construct that we have. It's a public trust situation. And so that the biologists know that this is the process that they go through. And so you can see that as we start to decide uh, what that uh, decision is gonna be, that there are, you can, you could actually start that initiation. There have been people that have come to biologists and say that I think um, we should allow X, like the spear fishing um, of, in fishing is a great example there where there was a person that came to the agency and started that conversation. Then they went through this. There's public meetings over here on the, on the left that we can all participate and give our, and these are scheduled around the state. Um, our administrators are people too and our legislatures are, are people too. And so we all have uh, these, uh, these things that we, um, these opinions, no matter what position we're in, that influence this process. And so um, as we come down to the end, we can see that um, in some cases, the decision to actually put a regulation in place um, uh, is happens because of how much participation level there's been and how much opinion there's been in the public. It may be because the legislature passed a bill that actually affected the change and almost, you would say, bypassed the Game of Parks Commission biologist process. And in some cases, ballot initiatives have also been used as a way to, um, well, you would say bypass this process, but it's also a democratic process, right? And so this is the political climate that we live in today that these harvest management decisions are made through a, a host of influences. And the main thing I just wanted to, to end with, with a photo here of this young angler attending a public meeting in, in Florida, is just to, to come back to this idea of public input and that both hunters and non-hunters are part of this stakeholder group. And the future uh, that we see with harvest management is going to be changed by the input that we provide to our state wildlife agencies as a, as a public. And so they'll make decisions that are there to maintain wildlife populations and ensure that we have opportunities to hunt them, but they need input as we go, go through that process. And that's an incredibly important part of the management decision-making process. And that's all I've got, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Um, and then next we have Jackson Ellis. He is the Hunter Education Coordinator with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And go ahead, Jackson. Awesome, all right. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well here and get my PowerPoint up. Um, like I said, my name is Jackson Ellis. Um, I run the ne Nebraska Hunter Education Program. Um, so hunting is kind of my, not only my job, but uh, you could say my hobby, and that's probably putting it lightly. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Nebraska, grew up uh, south of Omaha, south of Papillion on an acreage, um, and had a nice creek and woods behind my house that I got to explore as a kid. And I definitely uh, owe a lot of that to my upbringing, um, just kind of growing up with, uh, with worms and birds and, and deer and raccoons and all kinds of stuff. So um, I got through high school and went to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, go Huskers. 
um, took a took a uh, more than a few courses with Dr. Powell, and um, I, I can honestly say that I really enjoyed my schooling because of you know I I just enjoyed um, you know, talking about biology and nature and uh, and all those critters. So that kind of led me to where I am today. I got a, a part time job with the uh, Game and Parks Commission. Um, and at the end of college, and uh, and was lucky enough to be selected for this position about four years, the three three years ago now. So, um, lifelong hunter, um, angler, uh, loved camping and backpacking in the mountains. Um, but uh, as a hunter, I, I'm kind of a generalist. I do a little bit of everything. Um, but my my bow and arrow has a special place in my heart, and that's what I really really enjoy doing. Um, the picture down in the right hand corner is me and my fiance on an elk hunt last year. Um, she was the one with the tag. Unfortunately, we did not get one, but um, just kind of some of the adventures that we've had over the last couple of years um, doing, doing that. So, um, you know, the program that I run is really all about, um, you know, it came about because of safety. Um, so in the the sixties, um, you know, nationwide, there, were, there was a, a noticeable um, incident rate. Um, there was, uh, you know, just not necessarily negligent, but unsafe uh, behaviors that, that we, that as a nation, we wanted to get a handle on. So um, starting in the late 60s, states started getting on board with the idea of hunter education and a somewhat mandatory course um, for citizens to go through before um, legally being able to go out and, and harvest game. So um, that and, uh, and Hunter Orange came about at about the same time. Um, Legally in Nebraska, it became mandatory in 1974, um, and the program really just uh, evolved from there. Um, the uh, the Pittman-Robertson Act was amended um, in uh, in the late 70s to uh, include hunter education. So those uh, those dollars that come from excise taxes on sporting arms, ammunition, um, different types of outdoor gear um, comes back and, uh, and, and the hunter education programs across the, the United States benefit off of those funds, as well as, um, all those habitat projects, restoration, and, uh, and purchasing of public lands. Um, um, as, as, as the hunter education program has evolved over the last couple of decades, um, we've also grown to include, um, topics such as ethics and responsibility, and not just the safety aspects of being out there afield. So it's become much more of a more well-rounded program, um, not only about the safety, um, both for yourself and others in the field, but also the respect for, uh, for game animals, um, for the landowners. You know, in Nebraska, this is a huge issue. Um, uh, Nebraska is you know, 97 to 98% privately owned. Um, so chances are, if you're a hunter, you are uh, in, in contact with landowners. Um, and, and so we rely on those landowners not only as hunters, but as land managers um, to, to be able to, you know, to carry out those goals and those objectives that, uh, that are decided upon on, you know, based off that public trust. So um, yeah, a little bit about the, the Pittman-Robertson Act. Uh, Larkin touched on it a little bit, but um, in, in a general scheme of things, um, on the left-hand side there, you know, hunters and shooters purchase guns and ammunition, um, other outdoor products listed that uh, the manufacturers pay a federal excise tax on. So revenue then goes to agencies and then the state agencies use that for you know, projects, hunter education, conservation, and those sorts of things. Holly's gonna dive into this a little bit more. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of leave that for her here coming up next um, to really, really dive into. But I just wanted to, to kind of touch on that this is how the hunter education program is funded. Um, and how we how we generate our funds. It's it's neat to be able to say that through through the Pittman Robertson Act and uh, and the volunteers that we utilize for our program, um, the Hunter Education Program doesn't cost the taxpayer in Nebraska anything. So um, it's uh, it's a really neat program. Um, it's really really well encompassing. So, um, like I talked about Hunter Education, there was a um, we'll talk about some graphs here in a bit, but. Um, you know, hunting safety numbers were, were, were concerning. Um, and so the, uh, the idea came about to make this program to, um, to get most, mostly youth, but you know, as they grow up, they have these, these ideas instilled in them um, uh, for safety and ethics and responsibility in the field. So um, this is kind of showing that graph there, um, uh, showing the hunter incident rates. This is a nationwide 
um, statistic, but this can be shown in basically every state. Um, as soon as uh, hunter education and blaze orange became requirements in these states, um, the hunting incident numbers fell drastically. The trend, trend lines are, are you know, they speak for themselves. So this is one specifically for Nebraska. Um, you know, our numbers weren't quite as bad as some of, uh, some of the Eastern states um, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but uh, the same trend line can be shown um, for, for both in you know, general incidences and fatalities. You know, it's, uh, the program speaks for itself and the numbers uh, from year to year really show that, that hunting is, um, is a safe sport. You know, we're talking here about the, the incidences and stuff, but um, statistically, it is one of the safest um, hobbies to partake in. Um, so it's uh, year to year, it's not only tradition, but, uh, but hobbies, sustenance, you know, those uh, people gathering food for themselves and uh, sourcing their own protein. Um, and they're going on doing that safely. So like I talked about, the Hunter Education Program is, uh, has really evolved into, in, into the more of the importance of understanding, um, about the importance of acting ethically and responsibly. You know, hunters aren't the, the only ones out there in the field enjoying these, these public lands or these, uh, these animals and this public trust. And so, um, you know, so understanding the, uh, the stakeholders really in, in, in the game that you may, may encounter in the field. Um, you know, lots of times on public land, I've run into hikers and backpackers, um, photographers, all types of people in the field who are, who are out there enjoying the same thing, um, regardless of, of their, uh, the, their end goal. So um, you know, we teach that in Nebraska, um, like I talk about with the landowners, especially, um, we, uh, we, we teach a lot about, um, excuse me, my slides are a little wonky here, but uh, you know, we teach a lot about um, hunter ethics. Um, what uh, what gives hunters bad names in the field, and why why landowner relationships are ruined from year to year? Um, you know, the, the landowners are out there to make a living most of the time on their on their land, especially in Nebraska. Um, you know, um, damaging fences and driving across fields, and um, just a general disrespect for the land um, really comes down to hurt not only the hunters but in the long term. Um, you know, the, uh, the land managers and the biologists that are trying to achieve these, these land management goals and these conservation uh, goals. Um, and so if, uh, especially in a state like Nebraska, where if we, you know, uh, the public land is not available to everyone, or it is available to everyone, but um, it is uh, very limited in scope and size. Um, and so, you know, these, uh, these ethics become extremely, uh, extremely important. In a, in a state like Nebraska. So um, just kind of going back, um, you know, the hunter in orange and the safety ethics and the, uh, the, the respect for those involved have really, uh, really come a long way in the last couple of years. And I think that it's, it's gonna increase and become more, more widespread. Um, and so it's, it's been really encouraging to see. Um, I monitor hunter incident numbers every year, as well as um, complaints for, uh, through law enforcement and so um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to watch and it's, it is encouraging. So, you know, you, you always hear about the worst of the worst. Um, you know, you hear a handful of stories a year on social media or whatnot of uh, hunters behaving poorly. Um, but you have to keep in mind that on a given year, there are um, average in Nebraska is 100, 180,000 people every year, individuals step into the field with a firearm or a bow and arrow. Um, and, and so by and large, um, those people are doing it ethically, responsibly, morally, um, and doing it the right way. Um, so just a little bit, um, about the, kind of the hunter education program and what we do. Um, not only is it, um, the classes, you know, I, uh, I coordinate, um, between seven and 800 volunteers across the state. These are the men and women who are executing these programs. You know, it is a game in parks, um, curriculum. It is a game and parks program um, and oversight, but um, we don't have the staff to, to, uh, to train um, almost 5,000 kids uh, or individuals every year, mainly kids between the ages of 12 and 16. Um, but we, uh, we are a dual, what's called a dual um, certificate state. So we have a firearms course and a bow hunter course. Um, they're separate programs um, and uh, separate certificates for whether you're hunting with a firearm or a bow and arrow. So um, we give out almost 10,000 certificates every year. 
um, you know, those kids going through the program and, uh, and getting that information. But not only that, um, we also do a lot of what we call advanced hunter education. So this is uh, past, past the point of hunter education where we can, they kind of get that base knowledge and this is the above and beyond, those next steps. So we, uh, we host various mentor hunts um, whether it's through Nebraska and Parks Commission or um, support given to the Pheasants Forever, National Wild Turkey Federation, um, Quality Deer Management Association, um, lots of smaller groups across the state like uh, Isaac Walton League. Um, so they're, they're taking kids out for these hunts. You know, a lot of kids come to hunter education and they don't necessarily have that next step. They may not, you know, I was lucky enough to come from a family that hunted, but a lot of people, and I'm finding out, especially at my age now, um, a lot of people um, want to give hunting a try. They want, um, especially nowadays, it's very popular to get to source your own protein um, and, uh, and that locavore movement. And, uh, and a lot of these people don't have that, uh, that family support system or, uh, or you know, mentors, for lack of a better term, that, uh, that have, can show them the ropes. So we, uh, we utilize these programs. Uh, we host various shooting competitions. Um, the Cornusker State Trap Shoot is one of the largest state trap shoots in the nation. We, uh, we directly oversee the state youth silhouette uh, shoot um, and, uh, and assist with the state bow hunter 3D shoot and a lot of 4-H shooting events, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we oversee the state fair air gun range where we see thousands of kids every year um, and get to instill, you know, even if just for a couple of seconds, um, those, those safety aspects of, uh, of firearm safety that can be crucial these days. Um, we, we directly assist with becoming an outdoor woman program. Um, these are kind of like I mentioned, women um, specifically who want to get into um, outdoor pursuits, not only hunting, but um, fishing, camping, outdoor cooking, those sorts of things. Um, an awesome program, very, very well-rounded program. Um, various R3 efforts. So I, I would assume Holly's going to talk a little more about R3, but this is recruit, retain, and reactivate hunters. Um, we, we are directly involved in those efforts as well. Um, but basically, hunter education is kind of this, uh, this start on this catalyst, on this journey that a lot of people go through as hunters and outdoorsmen and women and conservationists and, uh, and, and providing the, the ground level safety, ethics, responsibility, morality um, that should surround your, uh, you know, the, the average hunter. Um, that's about all that I have for you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and, um, we can kick it over to Holly next. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just introduce Holly. She is the outreach and communications coordinator with Pheasants and, and Quell Forever of Nebraska. Thank you. Go ahead and get shared here. Okay, um, so like Jackson had mentioned, I will be talking a little bit more about the R3 efforts and I'll go more into depth than that. And I'll be speaking about how Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever of Nebraska and as a national organization um, move these efforts forward. So again, a little bit about myself. Um, unlike Jackson, my hunting experiences early on were very limited. Um, what I considered a hunter was going out twice a year, um, which isn't very active. And so I am more of what we classify an adult onset hunter, someone who is later in life learning the skills and becoming a more active hunter. I'm a partnership position between the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever of Nebraska and the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And I assist with state R3 efforts um, and recruiting new hunters and putting habitat first in conservation, which is a large part of the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever mission is habitat first. If we don't have habitat, then we don't have the wildlife populations that we desire when in hunting. So what is R3? R3 is a national movement that helps maintain people in conservation-based activities. As Jackson mentioned, R3 stands for recruit, retain, and reactivation. Without hunters, anglers, or those in shooting sports, we don't have the funds for that wildlife. Um, the Pittman-Robinson Act that Dr. Powell had mentioned and Jackson followed, those funds from buying the firearms, buying the archery equipment, buying the ammo, all of that goes back to the state to use in managing our wildlife system. 
the license purchases, your habitat stamps, all of that goes back to wildlife in some degree. And hunting is a very effective management tool. Dr. Powell touched on this earlier and I'll go a little more into it here later on. And so that's why R3 is such a large national movement. Without our hunters, we're going to lose our wildlife and our habitat that we have established for them. So various conservation organizations and even manufacturers across the nation are looking for ways to help bring back up that, that hunter population, that angler population. So a recent one that happened this year and over the summer was Mountain Dew's Get Outside ad campaign. So they actually hosted a competition of you sharing information and photos about you getting outside and getting active, whether it be fishing or spring turkey season. And they provided um, prizes for those who got outside and got active and supported the wildlife. And then across the nation, we have different states participating in the Take Home Fishing, Take Home Hunting campaign which I'll discuss a little bit more in the Nebraska aspect. So Dr. Powell spoke about this a little bit earlier. Um, the North American model of conservation is what we operate under here in the US. And it's based on the research of the health and the population status of the wildlife. And it can change yearly based on the um, information that we have on the health of those populations. And it changes the regulations that hunters and anglers end up operating on that year. Hunting is not an additive to mortality rates or death rates. It actually replaces those natural death rates. So here we have a chart straight from the, the hunter's education handbook um, is you have a carrying capacity that's that darker red down on the bottom. Let me get my laser here. So you have your carrying capacity or the amount that the land is able to sustain at a healthy rate. And throughout the year, you have your ups and your downs that the wildlife goes through. Now, when it gets too high for the carrying capacity, then you start having disease setting, you have starvation, you have accidents as they're getting pushed out of habitats. Um, and so there's a, a natural death rate that's going on. Hunting does not add to that. That rate doesn't go higher when hunting happens on, it actually replaces some of that natural death taking place. And that through hunting, we provide sustenance for ourselves through hunting, which many Nebraskans actually take place in. And it helps control those larger populations and maintain healthy rates, especially here in Nebraska where we have a very high deer population and very high rates of deer hunters. It's a great balance between that. And as Dr. Powell spoke about, this is something that we collectively work together to own the wildlife and make decisions on it. Uh, people can talk to Game and Parks about their decisions that they'd like to see, and Game and Parks puts in their input based on the research that we're having. And we pass that on through our generations as we move forward due to the North American model of conservation. Now, in an R3 effort, typically small game or upland birds are the first harvest for first time hunters. So rabbits, squirrels, um, doves, things like that are typically the first thing that's harded, harvested. Here in Nebraska, we have a, a different sort of situation going on. So through hunter surveys that we collect throughout the year, whether it be uh, telechecking your deer, wing surveys through your ducks and your dove and your grouse, that's additional research that we're collecting, um, like Dr. Powell spoke about, it's part of that social additive to the research that we're understanding. Are hunters happy with what they're harvesting in the field? Um, and what are, what are wildlife populations looking like when they are harvested? And it's up to each state to manage those populations. Now, I mentioned that nationally, small game is typically the first harvest. Here in Nebraska, because we have such a large healthy population of deer, it's actually whitetail or mule deer are the number one harvested um, for young hunters. And it's because again, we have a very large healthy population and it's also a much larger target. So for those of you who may not hunt, um, it's much easier to go after a big target than it is for a smaller target. And so that creates a great situation and learning opportunity for youth here in Nebraska. Small game and upland birds does follow in close second though. Um, so your rabbits and your squirrels and your, your dove and grouse follow up with that. And so that's a little bit about the history of R3 here in Nebraska based on that information. 
some projects that we have going on here in Nebraska for, for R3 is this year we hosted our second annual R3 Summit where we collect people who are interested in maintaining our hunting populations in Nebraska. And we bring them together to figure out what we need to do um, to help encourage new hunters, bring back old hunters. And so this year we developed three working group committees. So if you're interested in this, we are seeking volunteers. You can contact me for more information on these. So we have people looking at how to bring in diversity to our hunting audiences, our targeting new audiences, filling the gaps. Um, so we work with a lot of youth, but we're noticing that adults want to hunt too, but don't know how. So how do we bridge that gap? And then our last one is mentor tools and management. And that's filling, um, filling the information in for how do we continue teaching these practices and providing the best resources to those mentors that are teaching. If you'd like more information on what's going on here in the state, we recently created a Facebook page. The link is there. And you can join that group to stay up to date on what's going on with hunting here in Nebraska and the efforts that we're trying to do in order to keep this going on. We also have a tier one, tier two system that we're working with on the federal government for waterfowl. And so tier one is going to operate similar to how Things are already going with waterfowl, but a tier two system is going to operate on a splash method. So the first three ducks or waterfowl that hit the water, it's a lower bag limit, but it's going to recruit new hunters because on the wing identification won't be as difficult. And it's also going to help reactivate new hunter or old hunters because if they struggled with ID due to eyesight going out with age, it's an easier system for them to get involved, but it's all based on the research that we have. And so that's something that we're going to be testing this next year. So watch for that and take some time to get somebody involved with that um, as we explore that program a little bit more. And then the take them hunting, take them fishing campaigns. You've probably seen many advertisements from Game and Parks. You can check out more at the link that I have there. But these are reward systems for people who are getting people active in hunting and fishing. So you take a photo and you're entered in for monthly prizes and grand prizes, just in an effort to get people more knowledgeable about what's going on here in the state. More specifically, talking about Pheasants Forever in R3, um, last year we implemented a mentor pledge. And this year we've partnered up with Alps Outdoors. So you take the pledge to get somebody outside and active, whether that be in fishing, hiking, um, getting them outside, and you take a picture, you submit it, and you're entered in for monthly prizes every year. And the grand prize is a hunting trip or uh, experience for yourself and one of the mentees that you took out as well. And so if you're interested in that, I put the link there. Anybody can take it and get active. Just get outside and enjoy yourself um, and these wonderful practices that we have that sustain so many and help uh, care for our wildlife populations in the state. For Nebraska Pheasants Forever, we've been hosting youth mentor hunts for 25 successful years. So what this is, is our wonderful chapters and chapter volunteers across the state get youth rounded up. Um, throughout the year and throughout the hunting season for pheasants and quail. And we get them out in the field and provide them a safe, fun experience where they learn the skills to be responsible hunters and even get the chance at harvesting a few birds. And so that's been a tremendously successful program for us. And that's to the thanks of all of our wonderful chapters and volunteers. Through those 25 years, we've been collecting some data and we found that youth who graduate a hunter's education class are 50% likely to be in licensed sales. So they show up 50% of the time. But if they come through one of our youth mentor programs, we find that they show up 70% of the time in licensed sales. Through, through one mentor hunt, that's a 20% increase in the likeliness of them continuing to buy licenses and support wildlife throughout their lifetime. And so what we did with that research is we launched the Next Steps Hunt program. And that's a new one that we're running uh, currently. And what it is, is it's taking a youth, an adult hunting partner, so a parent or a family friend, and then a chapter mentor, and we pair them up and provide an intimate setting that they can go out and harvest more birds and gain more confidence in their hunting skills. 
And so instead of just taking a class and being turned out to be on their own to figure things out, we continue to work them through these skills. And so right as of right now, I have 41 participants, which is an outstanding number for the first year. If you're interested in it, the link is there. You can check out more on the Next Steps program and even enroll if you'd like. But we don't just do youth with pheasants forever and quail forever here in Nebraska, but we also focus on adult onset hunters. So we have a program that's fairly new, still in the piloting stage called Breakthrough. It's an advisory council where we have um, experienced hunters available for new adult hunters to ask questions with, potentially go out and hunt with these individuals and help build their confidence in their own hunting skills. And then something more specific to women is our Women on the Wing Beyond the Shot team. So Women on the Wing is the National Pheasants Forever Women effort to get women active in the outdoors and hunting. And Beyond the Shot is the Nebraska chapter. And it started with our lady staff members. And most of it was us learning together. But now we're feeling experienced enough that we're taking other ladies out to learn how to hunt. And it's women teaching women how to hunt in a very welcoming setting and it's it's been quite a blast we have a couple more excursions for this year so follow our facebook page if you're interested in learning more on that more specifically we've thrown out a lot of lingo tonight so i just wanted to take some time to discuss what small game is so pheasants forever you typically associate us with upland birds your prairie chicken your sharp-tailed grouse ringneck pheasant and bobwhite quail but it also includes the other species featured here on this page um, and regulations change for each of these species. So be sure to check out those guides that Dr. Powell had mentioned earlier. I have the small game and waterfowl guide pictured here. Um, those are available online or um, at any of our district offices. So definitely check out those regulations. Specific for hunting for upland species here in Nebraska um, and for small game, you want your traditional hunt small game permit. Um, and so that's available for all residents 16 years age of older and things with asterisks are just there's some uh, gray zones that you'll want to really read the regulation guide on um, as different species don't require it and residents and non residents differ. Um, so I just want to make that known but traditionally you're going to need your hunting license, a habitat stamp. Um, like Dr. Powell mentioned, different regulations between the times that you can shoot, 30 minutes before sunrise, sunset, um, only at sunrise and sunset. There's different regulations that go on for each of these species. Now, with small game and upland hunting, hunter's orange is not a requirement legally, but I highly recommend it, especially as a short person out in the field with very tall um, grasses and you're you're running through that grass chasing after birds makes it a lot easier for you to see your hunting partners as well as other hunters to identify you so even if it's not a regulation think about wearing it because of that safety aspect um, and really focus on being a safe hunter while out in the field again depending on species you have your harvest information program um, permit or your hip registration You'll need that if you're harvesting a migratory species and then your various legal methods of take, so shotgun, rifle, archery, trap, that all changes. So again, check out your, reg your regulations in those guides that change yearly. Um, we mentioned how the public can provide input on the, the, the information coming through that help us establish what our bag limits should be, how many animals you can harvest. And um, so there's a little blurb in the um, small game guide that you can go to to get information on those surveys. So specifically for um, the upland birds, you can save the wings of the grouse species that biologists can then use to help understand how our grouse population is doing. So that's just a quick blurb of what's going on with uh, pheasants forever. There is a competition going on currently and through January 31st that it's encouraging hunters to get out and pursue our upland game here in the state called the Upland Slam. The link is listed there at the bottom of the slide. It's a partnership between Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, and Nebraska Game and Parks. And so there's four species you can collect, a prairie chicken, ringneck pheasant, sharp-tailed grouse, and bobwhite quail. 
And if you harvest these species, you're entered in for monthly prizes and then some grand prizes as well. So that shotgun that looks nice and gorgeous up there at top is our grand prize this year with a uh, Ruffland kennel being the second prize um, and prizes are continuously giving out. So register, um, get active, get outside and really pursue that upland game because without hunters, we don't have wildlife populations or conservation efforts to help keep that available for people of all outdoor levels and skill raises. So quick thank you, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me here. If you have any other questions, we'll be going to our panel next, I believe our panel discussion. And um, so I'll leave my email up here and post in the chat if anybody has questions, otherwise we'll get moved on to that. Yeah, uh, and Mary Ann will be um, asking you guys our questions tonight. And if you guys do have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A and Mary Ann can put some of those in there for the speakers as well. Okay, well, hi. Thank you guys for speaking. It was really wonderful to hear everything you had to say. Um, going into questions, uh, Holly, since we already have you talking, a couple of questions I have written down to ask you. Why is hunting necessary to balance the ecosystem? And I guess I can go a little bit deeper and ask how um, the bird species affect um, the deer species. What is the kind of balance that's needed between them? Um, so I can go into this and then Dr. Powell and, and Jackson, you can certainly add into this as well. Um, so I'll kind of touch on that, that last question that you have. How, Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever's mission is habitat first. By focusing on the habitat at the basic level, you're not only impacting one species, but all of the species that work together in that environment. Um, so if you're trying to manage for deer, you actually can be managing for quail as well because they like similar habitat zones. Um, so if you're helping control one population in an area, you're actually making it so that more species can flourish together. Because if you have one species that's too high, um, so say for example, your deer, if they're overgrazing an area, then that's limiting the food availability for other species that are dependent on that area as well. So that's how hunting can help influence that is by managing those populations in those areas, you're helping all species thrive as well as the humans that harvest that game are sustaining themselves off of that game meat and providing that habitat to be even better for future hunting efforts and for those wildlife. Uh, I'll pass it on to the other two if you wanna add a little bit more into those questions. Sure, I, I can uh, talk just a little bit about the, maybe the role of hunting in the ecosystem, I think is how you phrased it. The, you know, I, I think it, it's, we're going to have to think about every species that we're considering um, because uh, it just depends on what that species uh, position is in the ecosystem and, and its current status. So there's, there's some species that may be um, what we would term from our perspective as overabundant species. Um, and so we, like snow geese is a great example. They uh, thrive in our agricultural systems and the corn that we provided in the spring as they migrated north uh, just uh, you know in the 1970s and 80s and 90s their populations took off and so there's an attempt now uh, it's actually not being incredibly successful to use hunting to bring their numbers back down and so um, as Holly suggests you know there's also habitat and uh, things we can do on the landscape to maybe um, keep their reproduction uh, in, in a little bit more in check than, than our corn, uh, <laughs> corn fed snow geese uh, were, was supporting that. So, so those are, you know, overabundant species we can use hunting to as a tool. Um, and in those cases, we actually hope that the harvest is additive uh, to mortality because we're trying to, trying to bring those populations down. You know, deer hunting is, uh, you know, if we, if we didn't hunt as much, we'd have a lot more car collisions. Um, we don't want, some people say, well, then why don't you hunt even more? Because I still see car collision, uh, but we want to maintain a population of deer um, to be able to hunt as well. So that's a competing trade-off there. And so, so I guess I'll just, uh, with the, those couple of examples, uh, say that it, it really depends on 
kind of each each species and and, and what we see as the objectives for the harvest um, and how that harvest can play a role for each species. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have much to add to that. I think Larkin Larkin nailed it. So on to the next. Think, perfect. All right, Jackson, I'll ask you. Um, what method of obtaining meat would suit Nebraska's citizens best, farming or individualized hunting? Ooh, that's, that is a great question. Um, a lot of that is going to come down to, you know, kind of personal preference. Um, I know, you know, uh, in this day and age, a lot of people, they, they're used to going to the store and getting their, their meat, uh, their protein. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bash on that at all. I, uh, I, I, I'm guilty of that as, as well. Um, guilty is not probably not the greatest word, but um, I, my fiance and I, for the last three years, have sourced our our own protein. We, we estimate about eighty to eighty five percent. We still do, you know, get a little bit at the store, and when we go out to eat, it's obviously not uh, wild game for the most part. Um, but uh, but I think uh, it, I think it's a great, it's a it's a healthy way to to gain your own meat. You get a, a great um, a great respect. For um, for that meat, you understand where it's came, where it comes from, um, and uh, and exactly what you know, not exactly what that animal has been um, you know, through in its life, but you you know it's a wild animal, and so it's uh, you, can, you can kind of make some assumptions there. Um, as far as what uh, what your pre what your game of choice is or your meat of choice, that's uh, again a personal preference. We do a little bit of everything, and uh, you know because if you you're having deer nonstop, it's going to get, uh, get a little old. So we, um, you know, we source uh, turkey, pheasant, quail, um, duck and goose, a little bit of everything. So we, between those, those different species, you know, Nebraska is a wealth of, of hunting opportunity and, and game opportunity um, from various species. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we utilize that to, to its maximum potential, we feel like. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I believe so as well. And I think that's wonderful. Um, all right. So would you guys like like a general question and kind of choose who would like to answer? Yeah, okay. Um, I have about three right now. How can hunters conscientiously harvest game this year? I mean, we kind of did speak a little bit about that already. Um, we can go into almost what is your favorite part of the hunting season? Well, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, my favorite part of the, the season is uh, uh, archery season, usually a little bit later when it's getting cooler. Um, I, I don't like hunting and sweating. That's, that's, uh, I like it to be cold. I, uh, I may be weird in that aspect, but I, uh, I really enjoy really enjoy a crisp morning in the woods. And, uh, and deer is my, not only my favorite game to eat, but my favorite game to chase. I think it's, uh, it's a challenge. And, uh, and trying to outsmart a, a white tail is, is, uh, is what I really enjoy the most. So for me, that's what I enjoy. Uh, but wild turkey is also up there on the, on the list of the most fun, arguably the best weather to hunt, uh, you know, game species in. And, uh, and the meat is, is uh, very, very, very good. So. Holly, what, what, uh, what do you think there? Um. Addressing the first question of how hunters can uh, consciously harvest this year, um, Jackson and I were discussing this before the panel started is I went out this past weekend for November rifle season and we saw a lot of young deer, so not very old. And so I made the choice not to harvest any of them to have better game sustaining next year. And so that's one way that you can make your decisions, really look at your game uh, be picky about what you're what you're harvesting um, if you have that option, because you in order to sustain a healthy population, you have to keep those that the young age is replacing the older ones. And so that's one way that I make conscience conscientious decisions when I'm out harvesting. To answer the second half of part of my favorite part is is not even always directly tied to the harvest is it's getting to wake up with the world in the morning, getting out before any of the animals are awake, you're sitting down, you're waiting, and the birds start waking up. And then you hear the squirrels start running and the rabbits start hopping through the grass. You're waking up with the world every morning. And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful part of hunting. Um, 
and perhaps my my second favorite part is is seeing someone new get to experience that as well. Um, and so we were out recently with um, a young hunter. It was her first time for deer season and she ended up successfully harvesting a doe. And I, I swear I get more excitement when, when somebody young gets to harvest or even an adult onset hunter for the first time to see them happy and be excited and so proud of what they've done because Hunting is often a lot of work that you're putting in and a lot of extra time. And so to see that reward come through um, is another great part of the hunting season and the hunting experience. When I, when I heard you say uh, this year, for some reason, because of the university, of course, we're dealing very uh, every every day, it seems like with thinking about COVID and and uh, reactions to that, I I went to kind of thinking about how can you hunt uh, safely this year uh, uh, in the and and so in one way COVID um, <laughs> related the you know getting outside is one of the greatest things. And when I was out actually last weekend uh, trying to see if I could have a conversation with a couple of deer myself there there were um, it was just this moment I'm looking around and there's like nobody in sight and I'm just like this is so peaceful just to not have to worry about do I have a mask do I not have a mask I'm outside now there may be some things that you know we need we do need to think about in terms of like how we get to that hunting spot and do that safely um, with regard to our local you know the, the situation and here in Nebraska right now it's not too great so taking separate vehicles to a hunt site with people that you don't live with uh, might be something that you should do, but um, but I, th I think hunting is actually a pretty fun thing to do this year and to get out away from that stress. Uh, and that pretty much I'll answer the second part of that too, that, that for me, I think it's uh, the motivation. And, and one of the nice, interesting things about hunting is that there's so many different motivations that people have. For some people, it's fill in the freezer. For some people, it is the chase. Uh, for other people, and I put myself in this category, it's just being out in nature. And even if I watch the, the rear end of a deer disappear away from me without ever figuring out how I can get a shot at it, you know, that's been a beautiful moment. And, uh, and I, I, I was out there and never smelled me and it just uh, went off. And, and so the, you kind of feel like you're a part of nature. And, and I love uh, being in, in the marsh for duck season. Uh, and the sun coming up too. Um, those are those are the the moments for me. Perfect. Well, um, a couple of questions have come into the chat board. One being, how do you or most hunters handle their meat products? Do you still do you still the same amount of beef as non hunters, or do you hunt enough game to last much of the year? And Jackson had hinted at that, that he does save up for the entire year, basically. Um, do any of you want to give a little bit of a kind of um, a take on that? I can start off on this one if you like. So I was last on the last one. The, uh, the you know, you, I guess in terms of handling, you definitely want to uh, be safe as you uh, process the game. And I'm sure there's just uh, tons of YouTube videos. I learned from a friend how to do it the first time. So depending on what species you're at, you know, cutting up a deer the first time was an interesting experience for me, to say the least. And so, but uh, washing it, getting all the uh, stuff off of it that's not supposed to be there, um, that that was uh, that's an important thing and, and important for food safety, just like you would do with anything else. Um, the um, the I, I, I don't eat all the deer. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always chipping away at how much I've got in the freezer. I've still got some deer from two years ago uh, that is hanging around. So, but I'll tell you what, this year with COVID and working from home, um, we've been able to have a lot more stuff in the crock pot uh, going during the day since we're here a lot more. And uh, we've, we've been able to chip away at it, but we still buy some other food. Uh, I've been on a weight loss program this year, and it's pretty nice when I look at my little Noom app to see how many calories are in venison compared to beef, as much as I like beef. So uh, there's another plus. Sure, I'll go next. Um, so as far as kind of the, the safety aspects of it and stuff like that, um, or the, even the quality um, is a big thing for people. You know, everybody's kind of got this... Uh, 
this kind of this idea that uh, that the wild game is it's gamey, right? There's even a word for it. But um, really, I would say that a lot of that uh, that that uh, that comes from the care of the meat from the time the animal is harvested. So as soon as an animal is harvested, um, there's three things you need to do. Um, first is get a field dress, so getting the entrails out um, and and cooling that meat off. So um, you know, especially uh, if the weather is warm, you want to keep that meat as cool as possible. Um, you want to first clean it and then dry it and, uh, and, and keep it free of dirt and, and debris and stuff like that. So keep those in mind um, when, you're, when you're harvesting your game. Um, there are certain times of the year where um, you know, I, I may not harvest a deer at the end of the day because I may not find it until the next morning or something like that. Um, so a lot of thought goes into that um, for me. Um, and then as far as, um, how much meat it takes to, to sustain yourself for a year, it can kind of depend. Um, you know, for example, my, my fiance and I, we, uh, we shoot four, three to four, three to five deer a year. Four is a pretty good number if I had to put a number on it. Um, and then we harvest uh, anywhere from three to five turkeys. Um, it's hard to put a number on ducks and geese, but, um, you know, then you can start stuff in there, but. Um, you know, we do a lot of, a lot of deer. So it's a uh, four is usually a good number for the two of us, um, but that's every family is going to be a little bit different. I'll echo what Dr. Prowl and, and Jackson have said. It, it's dependent on what and how much variance you like in your diet. Um, me being an adult, an adult onset hunter and my Beyonce being a non-hunter, uh, we we do about two deer a year um, with a couple of turkeys in there. And then I'm working on introducing more game throughout the year. Um, if you are worried about that, that gamey flavor, um, I started with turning most of mine into ground venison, adding in some beef or some pork fat, um, traditionally like your, your beef hamburger, um, and cooking it exactly like you would your, your ground beef. It'll be cooked on a lower heat just so you don't burn it. Um, but that's a great way to get started out in, in learning to adapt to those, those flavor changes. But after a few weeks, you, you don't notice too much of a, of a difference going on there. It's, it's a great, um, great thing. The one thing I probably would add that hasn't been mentioned um, in the preparation is I traditionally, um, just as you would have a separate cutting board or a clean cutting board for your veggies and your, your proteins, I have a separate board for my game meat entirely. So I have a separate fillet knife, a separate game um, cutting board. I have separate storage um, for the containers that I use for them. And that's not a huge part um, of, of it, but it's something that I do just to, to keep things separate and make sure that there is um, some level of, of health safety to it, but it's not a, a super huge concern. Um, there has been a, a situation where I have harvested an unhealthy deer and you just speak with your game warden about it. The, they'll often want to see what's up with it um, and pass that on to some biologists. So there, there might be a situation where that comes across, but not too often. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we're, I'm moving towards making my diet more of a, a game meat and like Dr. Powell mentioned, it's great. I'm getting ready to get married. So the diet has been on my mind as well. And you really switch that venison a lot more when you notice how many calories are in it compared to your traditional beef that you're eating. So great methods to do it. There are tons of great um, cooking shows that are available. Talk to any hunter. They'll always have a recipe for you that they'll be happy to pass on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a few ways to start managing more game meat in your diet. Yeah, definitely. All right, we have another question within the board. Um, and well, we can kind of go with whoever, whoever would like to answer it first. Can you address the changes or reductions in food sources for wildlife and reduction in numbers to hunt in zones around the US? Okay, looks like Chelsea Jackson is going to answer. might have missed that who is who, who's answering that one um i just got a message saying chelsea johnson is going to answer this question live 
So I'm a little confused by what that. No, that. Um, oh, I found it. And I, oh, it's you. Sorry. Yeah, How no, do you think most hunters handle the meat products? Okay. So anybody. So gonna... That was just the notification from the Zoom. Okay, perfect. So if you would like to go first, Jackson. Um, I'm a little confused what the question is, if they wanted to maybe phrase that a little differently, but um, the, you know, I think from what I understand, the difference is in agriculture um, and food sources in that respect. Um, you know, from, from, uh, from areas across the United States, it can really change. And snow geese is actually a great example of this and how changes in agriculture have, have uh, affected populations and not only um, you know, where, what they're eating, but where, where they are migrating to in the, in the, in the um, realm of waterfowl, um, you know, it used to be that, um, West Texas was heavily in the, the into the, uh, rice agriculture. And as that rice agriculture actually shifted East into Arkansas and Louisiana, um, so did the migration path of those birds, um, both snow geese and, uh, Northern white fronted geese. So, um, that can change um, drastically um, with the the migratory birds there. Um, you know, agriculture in Nebraska is dominated by corn, um, and that leads to um, you know, increased um, survival rates in deer, especially um, from late season. It's a very high calorie food source um, that is more or less readily available to them throughout the winter, um, leading to um, higher survival rates and, uh, and less starvation through the, through the winter. Um, if the question was leading in a different direction, I, I can edit that answer, but that would yeah, be. Someone, the attendee had said reduction in the food sources for the wildlife. Um, so, so I think you really did on that. I believe you did. Awesome. All right. Larkin, you got anything? Well, I was, I was, I think you're spot on Jackson and, um, I was interpreting it in the habitat, uh, as well, the, the, and the food resources in that habitat. And, and if you take, so the opposite end of what Jackson talking about, if you, if you take a species that maybe hasn't reacted to um, our agricultural system quite as well, um, and it might be our pheasants and quail, and I'm getting into Holly's field here a little bit, but the, uh, but you know, there, um, as we get rid of small grains out on the landscape, and have more corn and soybeans as we get rid of sorghum out on the landscape in Nebraska. There's just and uh, and less grass in some cases. There's there's less um, habitat and and insect food or um, other types of food for those things. And so that's one of the reasons that our um, small game hunting has been going down as well. And that's why Holly has a job because we're trying to to push that back up and do things for habitat and uh, get people back out doing uh, hunting of small game. And, and so our, um, when, when you perceive that you're not going to be as successful, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that hunters won't go out. Um, and that may be why, I think it was Holly that mentioned that we have this kind of unique thing in Nebraska where a lot of people, their first thing they do is deer hunting. Um, and it may be because they perceive they'll be more successful at that than going pheasant hunting, for example. Um, and so uh, that's something that uh, we're, we're trying to do at the university working with some research on how do we des help farmers design farms that uh, can be productive as well as uh, support uh, food resources for wildlife. And I'll go ahead and, and add on directly what, what Dr. Powell was just mentioning is we're learning to work with, with landowners and um, it, our landowners here in Nebraska are extremely special in the fact that so much of our land is private land here in Nebraska and many of them in their landowner aspects are willing to work with hunters and allow hunting on their land. Um, and so we're just trying to learn to find that balance between agriculture and providing habitat for those wildlife as well because many of those landowners are hunters in and of themselves and so they want to make sure that their habitat can sustain both. And this year was a phenomenal year for CRP enrollment. And many of those CRP programs are developed in portion with making sure we have habitat on the ground. And our farm bill biologists here in the state um, did a phenomenal job. And we had many landowners first time enrollments. Um, and we're looking at having another enrollment going on. And it's 
it's doing great. So although we are seeing reductions in food source due to agriculture, landowners are also trying to do their part to help put that habitat back on the ground in other methods. So um, CRP is one of those ways that you can do it. And then Pheasants Forever has multiple cost share programs that we work with landowners in um, cover crop planting. So they've already harvested an area, they plant some other um, winter cover or winter seeds for those pheasants, quail, other wildlife. Um, and then we also have uh, programs available for areas that aren't as productive. So your corners where traditionally your pivots aren't reaching, you can enroll that in one of our corners for wildlife program, plant some shrub thickets and some additional native grasses. And that provides habitat within that agricultural aspect while also supplementing the landowner for, for their changes on that. So there are some reductions being seen, but there are plenty of programs available that if a landowner wants to make those changes and bring that wildlife back onto their property, it's available for them to do. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, and I'll ask, what do you hope to see in the future of Nebraska game hunting? And, um, Dr. Powell, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, I guess, you know, the easy way to say it is that uh, we'd like to have populations of our game species uh, be successful, and we'd like to see a lot of people out on the landscape, as uh, Jackson and Holly suggested, um, that are um, uh, well-trained and educated and uh, excited about being out there. So, um, how we how we get there in the future, I think, is going to be interesting. And, and you know, we've got demographic shifts in our state, becoming more urban population and less rural. And so there are some real challenges um, to that. And, and I think that's part of the, the management of uh, hunting in the future is um, is doing exactly what Holly and, and Jackson are doing in their positions. Um, as well as our university where I work, uh, learning to, to bring in urban students um, that don't have as much experience in, in that area, or uh, at least don't see it out their back door all the time. And, um, and, and so I think that's part of what I see as a role for me in the future is, is working in that space. Great, yeah. Um, you know, kind of to, to mirror that, I mean, the, the, the main, the, the overall goal for, for hunters and conservationists is to have um, sustainable, huntable populations of, of wildlife. So um, as far as Nebraska specifically and what I would like to see, um, you know, I, I would love to see more pheasants on the landscape. We're doing a lot, a lot to help with that. And the last couple of years have really shown that. Um, and um, uh, deer, um, we, we had an, an abundance going back to the 2010-ish, and then we had a crash in 2012 after um, an outbreak of, of, of disease, of epizootic hemorrhaging disease, which is a whole other story. But, um, you know, the goal should be, um, you know, healthy populations that are not over abundance. And so in Nebraska, it's a very, it's a balancing act between um, the health of the landscape, the health of the, the populations, and, and also that, that stakeholder input um, you know, landowners, farmers, um, you know, they, uh, they have input as well. And, uh, and we all have to, you know, we all have to come to a uh, general consensus. And that's the, uh, that's the, the goal and both the goal and the bane of the Game and Parks Commission is that we, uh, we are trying to appease many, many stakeholders across the state, uh, manage these resources, uh, have huntable populations, um, and for everything to be sustainable. Not much to, to add, as it's already been said. Um, I guess it's exactly what Jackson said. We have, we have many parties working together to help um, really have this great balance going on. And I would even add that other outdoor enthusiasts, birders, um, people who just enjoy hiking and being outside, uh, finding a balance so that they can enjoy the, the wildlife in their natural habitats as well as they're, they're part of that stakeholder um, and, and managing those habitats as well. So again, finding that balance, making sure that healthy um, huntable populations as well as those that will keep that, that urban side um, 
happy as well so they can enjoy it just as much as we hunters do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another question that came in, why is it important to hunt antlers, antlerless deer? And I think that Holly or Jackson could really get on that or you know, you, Dr. Powell. So whoever would like to go first is more than welcome. I'm gonna let them answer. I'm gonna just uh, add the, the what, what I read in the chat was why is it important to hunt antlerless? And I was just gonna say, if you hunt with antlers on, you might get shot. So <laughs> that goes directly against hunter education. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but they can answer it the way it was actually intended. Okay, I'm good. Holly, you were last. Do you wanna do you wanna start so I don't see thunder here? <laughs> I know you'll be able to add a lot more on. Um, so on a on a basic level, the reason why it's important to hunt antlerless, um, like Dr. Powell spoke about early on, many of the game species that we have, um, one male can take care of multiple females, and so by removing one male, it, it has a different impact on the situation than if you were harvesting the females. And so the, the main reason why antlerless is really important is because our deer population is a higher population. And so by hunting those antlerless deers, your, your does, you're helping manage the population a little more directly than if you would be um, harvesting those bucks because the does are where your, where your population comebacks are really going to be coming from. And so Jackson, I know you can go a lot more in depth, but that's just kind of a basic on why antlerless would be important to hunt. No, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, the, the basics are that the, the females, uh, the does are the ones that are reproducing. Um, typically, uh, you know, in a healthy population with healthy um, uh, habitat and, and resources, um, the average doe is having two fawns a year. So if you're really, you know, in Nebraska, we are, we're, we're harvesting to um, lower the population. So um, in states where the, the population may not be as high, as booming, as healthy as it is in Nebraska, um, you know, they may limit antlerless harvest, um, you know, and, uh, and to, to, to maintain that breeding population, that breeding stock from year to year. So um, yeah, that's, that's the main driver behind the, 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 the antlerless permits. Um, is that it is uh, a driving factor there. A lot of, a lot of uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but um, there are units in Nebraska where we give out bonus antlerless tags actually. So for example, uh, Loop East, which is kind of like the Ord area, uh, Broken Bow, they, uh, if you were to buy a, a firearms permit, firearms deer permit that allows for either sex, so bu bucks or does, um, you have that initial permit, and then you actually get two bonus antlerless tags because um, the population is, is skyrocketing in that area. There are complaints from landowners and farmers, um, and uh, and they're actually you know um, damaging their ecosystem because there are so many deer. So the the the, the antlerless take is the answer to that, um, and and is really the driver behind the, that population management. And I'll even add on a bonus for the hunter. Um, by doing antlerless is sometimes those does have a little more meat on them than the bucks do because they're busy chasing girls and not eating uh, as much and those does are putting on the weight for the winter. So more meat for you when you're hunting antlerless typically too. Perfect. Another question uh, that comes to mind, when you say that it's a majority of landowners who do own the land that you're able to hunt on, how do hunters connect with the said land or landowners in order to uh, communicate and get onto the property and come out with the you know terms and agreements? Is there like a phone book of owners kind of basically? Um, Jackson, do you wanna? Absolutely, yeah. So um, there are many, many ways that people get access. Um, sometimes it's family relations, family friends, stuff like that. Um, um, you said they're a phone book. For example, um, we do have a, uh, an, a landowner and, and hunter uh, connection page on the Game of Parks website. So um, you can, as a hunter, you can sign up on that page and then uh, your information goes to landowners who can reach out to you um, specifically about antlerless harvest on their property. Um, same thing with elk. Um, we have, uh, we have a, a, a pretty significant elk population in portions of the state that, uh, that, that uh, kind of clashes with some agriculture. 
And same thing. Um, for example, last season, my fiance drew an elk tag and I called the, the game and parks office in the panhandle and they gave, they provided me with a list of landowners who, um, who just that put their name on a list for, for hunters to call. Um, the average hunter, you know, we refer to just knocking on doors. It's literally that, um, uh, you want to be you know, respectful, um, but also relate to those people when you go to their house to, to ask for permission. Um, you know, some people, um, you know, for, for example, myself, I, uh, the landowners who allow me access to their property every year, I send them Christmas cards, specifically the landowners saying thank you for that. Um, they get different types of gifts throughout the year, just as a thank you. And there's also, um, you know, a lot to be said about manual labor. Um, my cousin went to, he was from Colorado, came to Kearney for school. Um, he was a big waterfowl hunter. And in the summer, he would fix fence. He would do, you know, projects for these landowners that they may not have the time to do themselves on their land. And in return, he was allowed to hunt. So um, there's lots of ways to go about it. Um, and, and in Nebraska, there's, there's kind of limitless opportunities. You know, it uh, kind of gets a bad name as far as going out and trying to get access because, you know, nine times out of 10, you are going to get a no, you know, you're a stranger at knocking on their door. But, um, but if you, if you try hard enough, the, the opportunities are out there and there are landowners who are um, looking for people to hunt on their land. Yeah, especially with Facebook even. There has to be some sort of Facebook group to connect um, hunters and landowners. That's awesome, thank you very much for the info. We do have a couple of people in the chat saying thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, just another one, thank you to the panelists. Great information, I like the part about getting out in the great outdoors. Um, and another question that we can ask, what is the number one kind of safety rule that you need to take with you before you go out on a hunt? So I guess uh, maybe for first time hunters, what's one thing that really needs to be pushed into your mind um, for the safety of yourself, the people you're hunting with, um, for you know respecting the environment that you're hunting on? Um, so yeah, Holly, do you wanna start off with that? Sure. Um, so Probably my, my top hunting safely um, tip to, to new hunters is it's okay to be excited, but keep your, keep your brain turned on. Don't, don't let the excitement cause you to, to not think through situations um, because that's when, it's when you accidentally point a gun at the person in front of you or, or when you trip and fall in a hole or your safety is not on. It's, if, you're, if you're so excited that you're not thinking safety, then, then that's when you put yourself in a potentially dangerous situation. So that's my, my biggest tip, but um, overall, enjoy the hunt, um, enjoy getting outside and, and let, let that positive emotion seep through you and, and enjoy it. Um, but remember to keep your, keep your brain working so that incidents don't happen. I'll, I'll just uh, echo, although Jackson's the, the safety guy here, but uh, the, the, I think everything for me would revolve around gun safety and, and as Holly said, um, not, not feeling uh, like you are above uh, using just normal uh, safety tips. And I, I go out with a friend of mine, we're both in our early 50s and, and you know we still hold guns for each other as we go across a barbed wire fence and you know some people uh, may think that's uh, you know beneath them they can hold their gun while they go across but but uh, we still we still follow those rules and stay safe because we want to keep doing it for as long as we can. Excellent. I've, I've got just a, a handful of things here so firearm safety is first and foremost. The, you know, the, the business end of the gun, the muzzle end is, is always first and foremost where you want to be keeping it pointed in a safe direction. Um, so, you know, identifying your target, um, not only, you know, you never shoot at sounds, movements, anything like that, not only for legality, you have to identify what you're shooting at, but the, uh, you know, but the safety aspect of it. Um, and identify your target and what lies beyond it. Um, chances are um, your, your bullet or, or pellets are going to travel past that animal, whether you miss or hit it. Um, you know, finger off the trigger when, until you're ready to shoot. Keep your safety on, but the safety is a mechanical device, so we never trust our safety 100% of the time. Um, but the, the main thing is to always keep in mind where that gun is pointed. 
Um, you'll see, you'll see a, a, a someone who's very knowledgeable and skilled and understands safety. Um, will will do some some interesting things with their firearm to keep it always pointed in a safe direction in a group. So um, wear your hunter orange, even when it's not legally required. Uh, I would highly always recommend it, um, and, and take a hunter safety class. Um, in Nebraska, we, uh, we only require it um, between the ages of 12 and 29 for people who are hunting, but especially even those adult onset hunters, you know, our courses are open to anyone. Um, if you don't necessarily want to get into a course, a classroom course, um, where the average age may be 13, um, you know, we have our online course. It is geared towards adults. Um, and so there's lots of, lots of opportunities to get that knowledge, get that safety, and go out there and do it safely and responsibly. That's my spiel. Yeah, you did a great job. Thank you. Um, it looks like we are running on time. We're at an hour and 34 minutes. So we could, let's see here, do our little bit of closing. Um, let's see here. So I see we do have the um, how to report your harvest animals, um, your harvested animals and via telecheck because of the COVID kind of things going on right now. Does anyone want to kind of talk about that really quick? Um, going into, uh, is there a website that people can locate within, um, you know, Jackson, the, web your, the website that you're in, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Yes, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm following you. Um, yeah, so typically in Nebraska, um, during the nine day firearm season, you shoot a deer, um, you have to take it to what we call a check station. Um, biologists get a lot of data from that um, and they give you a metal seal to put on the antlers or, or the legs of a doe. Um, this year we're not doing that because of COVID. Um, so it's treated just like an archery season or a muzzleloader season where a telecheck is an option so or mandatory. So um, once you harvest your, your, your deer, before you go to process it or take it to a taxidermist or a processing plant or whatever you plan to do with that deer, um, you have to telecheck it. So we do it either uh, through a phone number. It's, off, it's right, dir written directly on your permit um, or uh, our website, outdoornebraska.gov forward slash telecheck. Um, and uh, basically what we're, we're asking is information about the deer, basic, uh, basic sex and age of the deer. And then uh, we'll give you a, a number to write on your permit that uh, basically cancels your permit, makes it a legal transfer um, from that public trust to a private ownership. Um, and then you can butcher, take it to a processing plant, the taxidermist, what have you. Awesome, thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> And I think I'm going over kind of our goals of the webinar today, and we hit all of them very wonderfully. Um, the safety measures that must be taken during any hunting season. What are the details of hunting for sustenance? Um, you know, hunting as a main source of protein, clothing, you know, things like that. Um, and then how to report our harvested animals. And we have kind of completed um, increasing community awareness of hunting programs and how they benefit conservation efforts in Nebraska. Um, and so, yeah, I just really want to thank you guys for attending today and helping us and being awesome attendees and panelists. And yeah, I don't know if Alicia, Alicia you want to get on really quick. Hi. So again, thank you guys. Thank all of you guys for coming. And um, for the attendees, um, just a reminder that that survey will be at the end when um, you exit out. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Goodbye. Have a great week. Take care. Bye. Bye.